This, this conference will now be recorded. Fantastic. All right. Um, you have a patient who shows up with um, acute cholecystitis and you have some suspicion that they have a stone in their common bile duct. Um, intraoperatively, you might feel a stone kind of in the cystic duct and you can find it or feel it um, with your grasper being milked into the common bile duct. Or if it's kind of a blurred picture with acute cholecystitis and a patient might have elevated transaminitis or a slightly elevated um, conjugate Billy Ruminibia, which blurs the picture, or if the patient has suspected cholangitis. So I have the Tokyo guidelines posted up on the right. Um, and you can see that a suspected diagnosis is when you have two or more items in column A, the clinical context and clinical manifestations. Notice that two, three, and four make up Charcot's triad, um, or two and more um, columns. I want to make this go away. Um, <laughs> from A and then one in B and one in C. So laboratory data uh, plus imaging findings like an MRCP. Um, showing this Hello? Uh, okay. I hear people talking. Okay, I'm just gonna go on. Um, so I'm trying to. duct um, and then showing the right and left hepatic radicals uh, filling the common bile duct I'm specifically looking for any feeling defects within the common bile duct sometimes within the hepatic radicals unfortunately and then I want to see filling into the duodenum so there's no blockage at the end of the um, common bile duct from the ampulla into the duo so this is a really good example of what looks like a Kumar clamp um, with the needle into the cystic duct and getting all five of those things. And I don't see any filling defects in this specific IOC. Not sure your slides advanced, Liv. It might be just slow internet. I don't know. Oh, shucks. Well, that's unfortunate. Well, I have a really nice picture of an IOC. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, Can you not see it? No, it's not showing up here either. Okay. Just hit escape and get out of that, and maybe. Let me try again. Can you guys see it now? No. Oh dear. Um, you're sharing my screen, so it says that. How about that? Oh no. or the, the indication slide. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, All right. I don't know. Hey, just stop sharing your screen for a minute, and then I'll give it back to you. OK. You back up. All right, now try again. Yes, sir. Um, I don't have an invitation. It says loading screen. Uh, huh. You still you still should have presenting ability. Okay. <laughs> okay. I don't um can anybody see my screen or no? Definitely not. Let's see if it's part of like another window. No, it's just your internet, I think. It's on the guest Wi-Fi uh, at the hospital. <laughs> hey Tim, if you have her slides. Put them up on your screen and just let her run your computer. How about now? So, <laughs> My name is spelled terribly. All right. Did you just re sign on? Yeah. All right, let me make you presenter. Okay. 
by far the most go to meeting problems we've had. All right. All right, we're making progress. I see. Who sees an IOC? Wait for it. Aha. Okay. Good. <clears throat> so this is the IOC that I was referring to. Um, so when you have, um, for us, most of the time we'll be taking a transistic uh, approach to the common uh, bile duct exploration. Um, 85 to 95% can be managed in this manner. Um, you have to consider that the stones that would be most easy to reach in this manner would be stones distal to the cystic duct, common bile duct junction, um, because you're gonna be inserting kind of in a downward fashion all of your tools. Um, if you're considering bringing stones back up towards you, you have to realize that the stones might be um, bigger than your actual cystic duct and then kind of defeat the purpose. Um, so something to keep in mind. And then after you get all of your stones out, you should do a completion clangiogram. For surgery, there's two approaches. You can use the Kumar clamp, which is the top left picture, um, and it is a special clamp that you can <clears throat> advance a needle through, um, and then you can inject saline or contrast to perform your IOC or do your flush. Um, techniques to this, meaning you have to um, actually come across the infundibulum in its entirety, so you end up filling um, the biliary tree instead of the gallbladder. And then the arrow catheter is um, a different kind of tool. You actually have to make a cystic ductotomy, um, and then you advance the catheter through the ductotomy itself. You can clamp it in place, and you can flush their dye or your um, saline flushes through that. Let's see. All right. So in the algorithm to trying to, um, now that you've identified a stone, trying to get it out, um, is... First, just flushing a large amount of saline through the ampulla, um, you know, trying to get it out, push it out. And a lot of stones will be cleared this way. Um, if you notice in the picture, there's a red rubber catheter. Um, you probably wouldn't be able to fit that through a transistic approach, but you could do it through a common bile duct approach. Um, the second um, step in that algorithm is you're flushing saline, nothing's going. You can give glucagon. Um, and glucagon will relax the sphincter of Odi and help facilitate the passage of those stones. Um, most people that I've talked to will do one milligram. I would warn uh, anesthesia because you can have a hypotensive event when you give the glucagon. So if you're concerned, you can give 0.5 milligrams. And then once you give the glucagon, just constantly flush the saline to try and get those stones through once the ampulla opens. And you can try this up to two times before you declare it futile. Um, <clears throat> the third option is you can put a four French Fogarty balloon down. I would do this under fluoroscopy guidance, um, get the balloon all the way down, blow it up, and then try and pull the stones back towards you. So this is the kind of event where you would want to make sure that your stones would fit through your, um, or your cystic ductotomy or else they're just going to get stuck higher up and become more of a problem. And then the fourth is you can use a retrieval basket. Um, <clears throat> so there's a couple different types. <clears throat> this is the one that I um, would imagine would work the best, frankly, but you, again, would um, insert through your transistic uh, ductotomy, and then you would insert it under fluoroscopy all the way down to the ampulla. You would um, open the basket and try and catch the stones as you um, pull back slowly. Um, you can do this with or without a colodocoscope. Um, it, I mean, I would imagine, I have not done this myself, but it would be a little bit easier to do it under direct visualization. Um, but I think performing a colodocoscopy through the transistic or through the cystic duct might be a little bit difficult. Um, <clears throat> our options here are a three millimeter cholangioscope or a pediatric ureteroscope. Um, we do have them available. I believe they're outside of OR16 still, if they haven't been moved during my research here. Um, you can freehand it over, or you can do it over a guide wire um, once confirming placement with your uh, fluoroscopy. Keep in mind that it requires a second camera, a second light source, and a second screen. And then 
you need a pressurized saline bag uh, to distend the common bile duct through your colodocoscope to make sure that you're inflating the duct so you can actually see what's going on. Um, and here's a picture of somebody guiding in a colodocoscope through the cystic duct. So if that fails, uh, you can do a laparoscopic or an open common bile duct exploration. Um, things to consider if you get into this debacle is it's not recommended in common bile ducts less than six millimeters in size just because you don't want your ductotomy to um, kind of be the circumference of your uh, common bile duct and then put, put yourself at risk for strictures. Um, if you do this um, a common bile duct exploration, you can explore the proximal and the distal ductal systems, whereas with the uh, cystic duct approach, uh, you would only be able to do the distal. And then you can actually do larger scope and larger stone evacuation. So something you might jump to your um, uh, common bile duct exploration if you saw like a larger stone that you knew you weren't going to be able to get out through the cystic duct. Um, <clears throat> and then the last thing is it will require a placement of a T-tube after the fact, um, so you should familiarize yourself with that equipment. And then I would also leave a drain. So common bile duct exploration, if you've already made your cystic um, uh, ductotomy, I would do your completion, um, cholecystectomy, and clip off your cystic duct. And then I would make a separate incision. I've seen, um, I've read two um, different takes on where you should make your ductotomy, um, but always sharply uh, so you don't um, have any heat injury to the common bile duct, and you want to do it longitudinally on the anterior surface. Um, what I read was, if you believe it's a couple stones that you'd be able to pull out, you can do it just distal to the cystic duct, but if you're worried if it's going to be an impacted stone that you're eventually going to have to do a hepatico or a colodoco J or colodoco duodenotomy, I would consider doing it more distal on the common bile duct so that when you do a transection, you're not, um, you don't have two different uh, incisions you're trying to close on the common bile duct. After you make your, well, before you make your incision, I would put stay sutures, uh, two different U stitches on either side of your incision so you can hold it open. And then when you insert your colodocoscope into the common bile duct, you want to do it at a right angle and you want to use that pressure bag to advance under saline inter, um, irrigation to distend it so you see what you're, um, what you're working with. Here are some pictures of an open common bile duct exploration. You can see in the left picture, there's stay sutures on either side and a very dilated common bile duct and then a small ductotomy in between those two stay sutures. In the right-sided photo, um, you can see again, similar concept, two stay sutures on either side, a very small ductotomy. You want to make it as small as possible because, it, not small as possible, but you don't want to make a massive rent um, 15 to 20 millimeters is what I was reading should be appropriate. This one looks a bunch smaller, um, <clears throat> but you want to advance it at that right angle. So then if you're um, just things to consider if you're doing an open common bile duct exploration versus a laparoscopic, um, ultimately it's the comfort of the surgeon. If you're MIS trained, you might be a little bit more comfortable proceeding in a laparoscopic fashion. If you are a maximally invasive surgeon and you like to get your hands into things, then open might be the way to do it. Um, mostly because you're able to feel and milk those stones and you're not relying on the tactile sensation of the grasper. Um, and then the second thing that was mentioned was doing performing a coker maneuver to mobilize the duodenum so that you can bring it up towards you. Um, <clears throat> and then the all absolute bailout is if you've got a stone that's completely impacted and you're not able to get it out, the best thing to do is drain the biliary system with a colodoco J or a colodoco duodenotomy. Um, and that's what I have pictured here. You see the... Um, Cholecystectomy is already performed with the cystic duct duly clipped. You make a distal um, transection through the common bile duct to preserve blood flow. And then you make a very small incision in either the duo or the jejunostomy, depending on what has more freedom and more give, what's easier for you to get to. Um, and then 
you would uh, anastomose the two. You can do it interrupted or you can do it running depending on how big it is, um, but always you want to do it with an absorbable suture. So uh, T-tube placement, it was mentioned before, but what is a T-tube? So a T-tube is a right angle set of tubes. Um, the small picture that's black and white is the cut version, um, but it's 12 or 14 French. Um, what I've shown you is the fillet version of the tube. So that's kind of how you want to fashion it yourself with a pair of scissors in the OR. And you have one end is typically a little bit longer than the other. And then you have those triangles cut out in the center. And so that's when you're pulling it out. It's easier for it to come out of the common bowel duct. And it's also easier to place because um, you can kind of fold it half and let it spring open within the common bowel duct. Um, so you're going to close your colodoco, uh, sorry, colodocotomy. Um, what I read is cranially um, around the T-tube with a four absorbable suture. There's been a lot of um, uh, evidence that shows if you don't use an absorbable suture, you are uh, predisposed to forming stones. So always use absorbable. Um, and then when you're bringing out the T-tube, you might have to make a separate stab incision, not use one of your port sites, but you want to have a smooth curvilinear root of the T-tube outside of the ad abdomen. And then, um, as mentioned before, you want to place a drain in the gallbladder, wall, uh, gallbladder fossa um, to make sure that if you do have a bile leak, that you can recognize it early. Uh, and then management of a T-tube is something that I also wanted to discuss. If you have um, an impacted so say you aren't able to get out the stone, but you don't feel comfortable doing a um, colodoco J or colodoco duodenotomy, um, I would leave that T-tube to drain because that's going to be your drainage procedure um, and your bailout before you call or after you send them to probably like a hepatobiliary hospital to help manage. Um, but if you got out all the stones, but you had to make a common bile duct incision, I would consider doing interiorization, so a clamping trial, and see how the patient can tolerate um, their own bile flow after a completion cholangiogram, obviously, to make sure that you don't have any distal stones. Um, and then the good thing about a T2 placement is that you can um, do further procedures through a T2, so our interventional radiology can um, access this T-tube and go in with their wires and tools and potentially break up the stone for you um, if you don't have GI around. Um, and then the last thing is you want to make sure you leave these T-tubes in place for at least, at least six weeks. The body will form a scar tissue around it, um, pretty much a fistula around the tube. And once you um, pull the tube after six weeks, that would potentially stay open. Um, for further access if necessary, but I, obviously I would, um, you could do a fistula gram through it before you pulled it to make sure that there was uh, no complications before you lose that access. So that's all I have for surgical access. Let me see if so, I can. So Liv, a couple, a couple things real quick. Okay. Uh, or sorry, Rob, if you're gonna go, go ahead. I, yeah, I'm here. I know you looked over her talk. Yeah, there's a few things. I guess the, the preface to this, sorry, because like the order of things got got messed up, but a lot of these interventions, I cannot stress how important it is that you have a talk with our GI colleagues before we embark on any of these things. A lot of these things that we do <laughs> uh, depend on what GI support we have at our hospitals. And so, you know, I, I've worked at places where our post ERCP pancreatitis rate was unacceptably high. And so we did all of these kind of gyrations for stone disease in the common duct because quite frankly, we just didn't want our GI guys involved. Here, it's a totally different story. And so those, you know, I know that the fellows, the GI fellows already know that we have a pretty um, open uh, and working relationship whenever someone comes with Colodoco. So I would encourage anybody that sees these patients in the ER just to get on the horn real quick so we can just talk about it. Something, you know, there's a lot of talk about timing. My personal my timing of interventions is whoever can go first it's to go first. Uh, and so frequently that's our GI colleagues, but not all the time. The other thing is like, you know, when Olivia was talking about all those things with colodocoscopy and everything like that, to be honest, I've done, I've seen one colodocoscopy my entire career. So that's something that uh, is, it's not of historical interest. It's a good tool to have, but quite frankly, 
it's going to give the OR a lot of, you know, chest pain when you ask to do that. And so quite, you know, when I have something that looks like it's going to need further intervention, I've been very lucky in that I can just call on, you know, I can call on GI and, you know, they can take care of the problem afterward. Uh, the common duct stuff, I am, I do not do that laparoscopically. It's hard enough, in many cases, it's hard enough to do open. So, and if I'm thinking I'm going to be doing anything more than cholangiography, I, I stick with open one, but Olivia was correctly right. If you if you have the skill, you can do it laparoscopically. Okay, Tim, what do you got? Uh, duo J, or I'm sorry, hepatico duodenostomy is a bailout only, right, Olivia? So if you had the choice between a hepatico J and a duo, or a hepatico J and a hepatico duodenostomy or coedoco duodenostomy, which one would you choose and why? I feel like I would perform whatever is most easily doable. If you can get the duo, if you have access or range of motion yeah, on the duo to do I'll just go it. Go quickly because we got to go. But uh, so the problem is something called sump syndrome. So if you have food mm -hmm. going by your connection to the bile duct constantly, you get reflux cholangitis, and eventually those patients will get cirrhotic from that. So if you have a young patient who needs this thing to work for a long time, always use a defunctionalized limb of jejunum. Got it. So bring up a, you know, 30, 40 centimeter limb of jejunum so that no food will reflux into the biliary tree. Okay. Uh, uh, that was one. I can't remember. There was something else. Oh, I don't think. So if you had to open the bile duct and it was big and dilated and you got all the stones out and you didn't need access to the duct anymore, then I think you can just close it without a T-tube. You don't always have to leave a T-tube because a T-tube is really like a controlled leak and access to the bile duct. And so if you don't think it's going to leak and you don't need access to the bile duct anymore, then it's okay to close without a T-tube. So just to make that distinction, you don't always have to leave a T-tube. Would you close it over like an argyle or something to make sure that you're not backwalling? Or... No, I wouldn't stent it either. So like, yeah. like, like Dr. Vreeland said, yeah, you can primarily close it. I would leave a drain nearby the closure every time, but you don't need to close it over a T tube. Yeah, because if it's obstructed, it's going to be like a centimeter, right? And so you're just closing a centimeter tube. It shouldn't be a big problem. If you're closing a three millimeter bile duct, then you might be worried about it, but you shouldn't be opening that duct in the first place if it's not dilated, you know? Okay. Awesome. Thanks, sir. Sirs. Okay. All right, you guys, time to go on to the fun stuff, endoscopic techniques for biliary access. Um, Olivia, looks like you got my presentation up, so mm -hmm. um, let's go ahead and get started. So I'm Jerry Edelson. I'm one of the uh, PGY-5 second-year GI fellows here to talk about endoscopic techniques to get in. Next slide. So Coming up, and it's not working, of course. There we go. Um, okay, so this is an outline of what we're going to go over today. We're going to discuss pre-ERCP evaluation, uh, orienting uh, the fluoroscopic picture to ERCP, identifying the ampulla. And then I'm going to go through some basic cannulation techniques and then some advanced cannulation techniques. Next slide. So you absolutely have to know your patient. You want to make sure you understand the indication for ERCP and that you have a solid indication for what should now be a mostly therapeutic procedure. You want to make sure to understand the anatomy of your patient, know if they've had surgery, such as any duodenal or stomach procedures, a Whipple, a Bill Roth, as this will help dictate what scopes you can use and how you're going to sedate this patient. Uh, you want to make sure to view any imaging. MRCPs are often useful. They can help highlight anatomy. You want to make sure to look in impacts and look at any prior cholangiograms, prior ERCPs, and come up with a plan of what you want to do. You want to make sure you know the tools and techniques. Be familiar with what you have in your shop. Know which wire and catheters are favorable for which situations. Um, prevention of pancreatitis. This is its own talk, but we're just going to say we recommend appropriate prophylaxis to high-risk patients. Um, and you want to plan your procedure. So I like to think of ERCP like a football quarterback. You have to know your progressions, like when you're reading the defense. you got to know who your first receiver is, your second receiver is, who your tight ends are, and go through the progressions. Same thing applies here with the RCP. So for example, you like to start off with the sphincter atoma. If that's not working, add a guide wire. And if that's not working, you can then consider other options like access sphincterotomy with PD stenting in selected cases. Next slide. So you always want to ask about the anatomy, particularly about the plumbing. For example, doing an ERCP in an intact stomach is quite different than doing it in someone who's had a Bill Roth II or a, or a Ruin Y. 
Uh, in addition to uh, knowing the anatomy, you also want to make sure you understand the path of pancreatic biliary drainage. And this is often done best through looking at uh, imaging studies or trying to find the original uh, surgical op reports if you're able to. Next slide. Um, you want to make sure you have a good understanding of what tools you can use. What are your devices? What devices do you have available for dilation? What are your options for stone removal? Also, what are some of the cannulation techniques that you're familiar with and you've had the most success for? And also making sure you understand that there's small advantages to certain devices and techniques in specific situations. Next slide. I really like this quote by Albert Einstein when talking about ERCP because it seems like it can often be so difficult to do what, what should be a, an, an easy task. So the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results. So with ERCP, you want to make sure you're being persistent and not insane. Next slide. That being said, it's important you know when to stop. You need to know your own comfort level with advanced techniques. Make sure you're mitigating high-risk behaviors. Consider time limits and always remember patient safety first. Next slide. All right, so let's talk about some of the imaging. So uh, on the right, you see a picture of the scope in the short position. Conventional biliary anatomy is as follows. You have two right-sided anterior segments draining into an anterior duct, which then fuses with a similar posterior right-sided duct to form the right hepatic. Segment two, three, and four join to form the left hepatic, and the right and left hepatics converge into the common hepatic, which once the cystic duct comes in, you get the common bile duct. So this conventional anatomy occurs in less than two-thirds of the normal population, and there's a wide array of biliary anatomical variants. Thankfully for the endoscopist, most of these are easily and safely interpreted on MRCP and are often reported by the radiologist. However, it is helpful for the endoscopist to understand a few of the more common variants, which is its own topic for another day. Next slide. So it's important you understand you have the bile duct, the pancreatic duct, and the circular and longitudinal muscles of the sphincter. You need to understand where those are and plan your attack for how you're going to accomplish what you're going to do. There are certain basic techniques and tricks of the trade in scope manipulation and handling of accessories that can improve the success of your procedure. An important aspect is to understand the need for proper access. Three key words that summarize this approach are access, orientation, and alignment, or AOA. So axis is defined as the luminal direction of the distal bile duct or pancreas in relation to the papillary structure of prominence in the duodenum. This is an anatomical component. It's not something that you can change except with conditions that alter anatomy, such as large periampillary diverticula or other abnormalities and pathologies such as ampullary pancreatic tumors. The axis of the bile duct or pancreatic stricture is defined as the course of the luminal narrowing of the respective ducts, whether it's straight, tortuous, or distorted, depending on the nature of the underlying pathology. Orientation refers to the approach to the bile duct or pancreatic orifices using the scope. In general, orientation is affected by scope position, be it short or long, sideways angulations, and duodenal anatomy. Now, with a short scope position, the papilla can be seen in a proper in-face position in about 95% of cases. When there's distortion of the duodenum or a periampillary diverticula, adjustment of the scope position is necessary to maintain proper orientation and navel cannulation. Similarly, when you're trying to get into a biliary stricture, the orientation of the accessory or guide wire inside the duct can be optimized by moving the scope tip and by advancing or withdrawing the accessory or catheter. The third, third tenet is alignment. So alignment refers to the importance of positioning the accessory coming out of the scope channel in line with the axis of the respective ductal system. Whether you're using contrast or a guide wire to guide the cannulation process, further adjustment of this alignment can be achieved with fine adjustment of the scope tip or by changing the angle and curvature of the accessory sphincter comb by insertion or withdrawal or by traction on the cutting wire, also known as bowing. In most cases, the tip of the guide wire is straight and the direction can be maintained or altered by movement of the tip of the accessory or by how much wire is protruding from the tip. Another way you can do this is also shape the tip of the accessory that's being used to insert the guide wire. Next slide. The standard ERCP cannulas are typically five to seven French catheters with a straighter tip, taper tip that take a 0 0.035 inch guide wire. The use of a triple lumen cannula allows a preloaded guide wire and injection of contrast without removing the wire. Many endoscopists also use ultra tapered four French, three French catheters for cannulation of tight bile ducts and pancreatic ducts, which can take a smaller guide wire down to 0 0.018 inch. No published studies have directly compared cannulation success between standard and small caliber catheters. Now, cannulas with or without guide wires are limited in their ability to approach the uh, angle of the papilla. The standard papillotome was the device originally used to allow variable upward angulation for biliary cannulation, bowed up to enter the orifice and then relax to achieve deep cannulation. 
Now, the main limitation of a standard catheter is that the direction of the tip cannot be manipulated independent of the endoscope to gain access to the desired duct. On the other hand, sphincter tomes have a flexible tip that you can use to facilitate orientation and the proper access. For this reason, sphincter tomes are often used as an initial cannulation, particularly when there's a high probability you're going to do a sphincterotomy. So what does the literature say? Well, in an early randomized controlled trial of initial cannulation in 100 patients, a sphincter tome without a guide wire was successful 85% of the time compared to 65% of the time with a standard cannula. In a subsequent randomized trial, cannulation rates were again similar, but the use of a sphincter tome was associated with a significant reduction in cannulation times and the number of attempts required for selective duct cannulation. Now, in the past, it was not quite clear whether guide wire cannulation increased or reduce the risk of pancreatitis. A multicenter observational study showed that guide wire cannulation was associated with a higher risk of pancreatitis by univariate but not multivariate analysis. Now, I think this probably reflects the, the preference for use later in the procedure by participating endoscopists. In contrast, a follow-up randomized study looking at 400 patients found that while successive cannulation was achieved in similar frequencies with a guide wire through a tome versus a tome alone, the rate of pancreatitis was significantly lower in the guide wire group, presumably because of less pancreatic contrast injection. So overall, available evidence supports the use of the papal tome with or without the guide wire in lieu of a standard cannula as your initial cannulation device, because these devices are more efficient and more successful and also uh, convey reduced rates of pancreatitis. Next slide. So cannulation is best performed in the on-face position. You have to have attention to the appropriate access to get in. The biliary access is that of the intraduodenal and intrapapillary segment of the distal bile duct and is represented visually by the prominence above the papilla at the 11 to 12 o'clock direction. Likewise, the PD access is around 1 to 2 o'clock. Cannulation of the CVD is usually achieved by approaching the papilla from below and aligning the catheter with the correct axis. The tip of the catheter or contained guide wire is directed to the left upper corner of the papilla in the 11 o'clock position. The catheter or tome should be flushed and primed with normal contrast to remove any bubbles prior to insertion into the scope. Air mixed with contrast injected into the biliary system can mimic stones. It can also cause more serious pancreatic injury to over distension. And when you try to flush contrast in the duodenum to prime the catheter, it can cause uh, duodenal motility and uh, obscure visualization of the distal bile duct. So once you have your accessory engaged in the papilla, further manipulation is guided partly by fluoro, observing the wire or injecting small amounts of contrast. And this will show you what maneuvers you have to do to get deep cannulation. Now the combination of the fluoroscopy and endoscopic images can give you a 3D image of the papilla and a distal bile duct. When using a sphincter tome, the alignment of the tip and the wire can be changed by tightening the cutting wire. Now there's a variety of movements you can use here, including up and down, right and left, sideways angulation, left wrist, right rotation of the endoscope, advancing withdrawing the scope and moving the elevator. Suction will collapse the duodenum and pull the papilla closer to you while air insufflation will push it away. And during attempted cannulation, you want to lock the control wheels to allow fine adjustment of the scope tip and avoid any recoil while adjusting controls. However, you got to make sure you uh, take those locks off if you're going to have any excessive repositioning. Next slide. So most novice endoscopists find pancreatogra uh, pancreatography easier to perform than cholangiography as the PD axis is more horizontal and in line with the catheter as it emerges from the scope channel. PD cannulation is normally achieved by inserting the catheter with or without a wire perpendicular to the duodenal wall along the one to two o'clock orientation of the papillary orifice. If you do use a guide wire, you wanna make sure you're careful and don't put it in more than one to two centimeters to prevent entering and damaging a, a branch duct or something like this. Next slide. So for this slide, where would you aim for CBD cannulation? Next slide. Right there, right at 11 o'clock. All right, next slide. So here's some cannulation tips. Again, make sure you look before you leap and you don't wanna um, jam the catheter uh, into the papilla. Next slide. All right, so let's talk about some advanced cannulation techniques. So I'm just going to real quick go over some of these, and I have some slides for others. So contrast injection. Uh, this technique is useful if you've got a tight biliary stricture. So say you're trying to get in and your wire pops right back out at you. Um, you can put a little contrast in to help highlight the correct trajectory. Um, the double wire technique and wire over PD stent will go over on the next slide. And then with regards to pre-cut sphincterotomy, um, I think access sphincterotomy is probably a more accurate term. And again, we'll talk about this on the next few slides. Next slide. So in addition to being commonly employed in clinical settings, the double wire technique has also been validated in the literature. 
A randomized controlled trial assessed the efficacy and safety of pancreatic wire placement for achieving biliary cannulation. In a study looking at patients who had failed conventional cannulation and were randomized to persistence of usual techniques versus placing a pancreatic guide wire to facilitate cannulation, success was achieved in 95% of the patients with the PD wire compared to 60 in the persistence group with no episodes of pancreatitis or other complications in either group. Although I do have to say it's rather interesting that serum, serum amylase levels were significantly higher in the pancreatic guide wire group. The efficacy of this technique was also endorsed by another group who reported uh, using a PD wire in 32% of all of their biliary cannulations with no difference in complications when compared to easy cannulations. However, concerns about PD cannulation have, have been raised in data regarding stent, playment, uh, stent placement following PD access as its own talk for another day. Next slide. So when wire access to the bile duct is not achievable, a pre-cut can be indicated. Now this approach is determined by two key factors, namely the size of the bile duct and the morphology of the papilla. A variety of techniques are available, some of which I'll discuss on the next slides. Now, we know that based on a meta-analysis of six randomized controlled trials, including 1,000 DRCP patients, that pre-cut sphincterotomy using various techniques when compared to persistent attempted cannulation using standard techniques have similar success rates. However, there is a significantly lower post-DRCP pancreatitis rate in the early pre-cut sphincterotomy group. The overall adverse event rates, including bleeding, pancreatitis, cholangitis, and perforation were not significantly different between the early pre-cut group and the persistent attempt group. And this evidence suggests that in experienced hands, persistent cannulation attempts and early implementation of pre-cut sphincterotomy have similar cannulation rates. However, Early pre-cut sphincterotomy reduces the incidence of post-DRCP pancreatitis without adversely affecting the overall adverse event rate. Next slide. So these are some of the, the different pre-cut techniques. So first, I'm going to talk about the picture on the left, figure A. So figure A is a pre-cut papillotomy. You're going to use a needle knife. That's that wire with a little uh, the, the catheter wire coming out to dissect the major duodenal papilla to visualize and cannulate the CBD. Typically, you're gonna put your needle knife at 11 to 12 o'clock in the papillary orifice and cut upward along the midline of the intraduodenal segment of the bile duct to expose the CBD. The biliary sphincter muscle can be recognized by its whitish onion skin appearance. And once you expose the muscle, the papilla often looks like a red dot or a nipple-like structure. Um, and you can even see bile coming out. Once uh, you've done this, you can easily cannulate the papilla or you can cut more if you need to to get in. Now, the picture on the right is a pre-cut fistulotomy. So in this case, you make an incision using a needle knife in the area of the papilla above the papillary orifice that covers the intraduodenal segment of the distal CBD to create a fistula between the duodenal lumen and the CBD lumen. The incision can be extended downward towards the papillary orifice or upward depending on the initial incision site. The pre-cut fistulotomy technique leaves the sphincter and papillary orifice intact and creates a fistula that allows the endoscopist to directly cannulate the CBD. Now, at least in theory and based on some anecdotal evidence, which I'll go over in a second, this method appears to reduce the risk of thermal injury to the pancreatic orifice and therefore PEP. So what does the literature say? Well, there's little comparative data on the efficacy and safety of pre-cut uh, papillotomy compared to fistulotomy, which are the two of the most widely used techniques. In a randomized controlled study of 200 patients with suspected cholelithiasis, in investigators found similar success rates, but more importantly, the rate of post-DRCP pancreatitis was zero in the fistulotomy group compared to eight in the papillotomy group. Another retrospective study from the Mayo Clinic looking at 103 consecutive patients confirmed these findings. Now, the finding that uh, fistulotomy may reduce the risk of post-DRCP pancreatitis could be due to the fact that this technique avoids the papillary orifice, whereas pre-cut papillotomy causes trauma and a cartery effect in edema of the pancreatic orifice, which might result in poor drainage and then give you uh, and then give you pancreatitis. Next slide. All right. So these are videos. Um, we can try to play these at the end in the interest of time. I don't want to click off and have it not work, but these are videos of sphincterotomy and fistulotomy. So we'll come back. Next slide. All right. So now let's go over some EUS guided biliary advantage techniques. This is the cool stuff. So EUS guided access is, is good specifically for an inaccessible papilla secondary to altered anatomy or a proximal stricture or a distorted papilla from an anterior eroding tumor. Since it was first described in 2001, EUS guided biliary drainage has been increasingly used as an alternative in patients with obstruction who fail centered ERCP. 
There's been various endoscopic approaches have been described, including the two major approach routes being the transgastric intrahepatic and transduodenal extrahepatic. Three major drainage procedures have been described and are listed below. Now, to date, the optimal strategy of EUS guided biliary drainage has not been established with the choice of the approach route and procedure depending on the patient's anatomy, underlying disease, including uh, being a benign or malignant, prognosis for survival and location of the stricture. Next slide. That, that being said, I think it's important that you recognize that these variant EUS guided approaches must be viewed as complementary rather than mutually exclusive. Now, on the next few slides, we'll discuss the preferred patients for each strategy, but I do want to say that patients with a distal bile duct obstruction without prior gastrectomy who have both intra and extra hepatic bile duct dilation and no growth societies are really the only ones, and there's an issue about which access site might be more preferable, intra or extra hepatic. And really, we need further studies to, find it, to better define the benefits of approaches in these specific situations. Next slide. So this is a EUS-guided coli doco duodenostomy. So I'm just going to real quick go through the steps of this procedure. So what you're going to do is you're going to put an EUS scope in and find a good extra hepatic duct through D1. You're then going to puncture the bile duct with a 19 or 22 gauge FNA needle, aspirate the bile, shoot a little contrast in to make sure you're in the right spot, and then wire it up and manipulate your wire in the desired position. After that, you're going to create a fistulous tract using a bougie balloon or cartery dilator while maintaining the dilator, or sorry, the guide wire. Following this, you can deploy stents to the dilated tracts between D1 and the extra hepatic bile ducts. Now, most studies describing this technique use self-expanding metal stents. However, uh, LAMs can also be used with high clinical and technical success rates. So, in addition to the underlying common rationale for employing EUS guided biliary drainage, um, there's uh, quite a specific rationale for going for a colidoco duodenostomy. Now, the common bile duct is much more easily imaged under EUS than the intrahepatic bile ducts, in addition, in contrast to what happens in transabdominal ultrasound. So this means they can be imaged and accessed under EUS without added risks, even in patients with minimal or no bile duct dilation. In these patients with dilated bile ducts, the common bile duct is a much more obvious target for puncture than the intrahepatic ducts. This results in faster, cleaner access without repeated puncture attempts, thereby minimizing risks. The retroperitoneal location of the CBD also makes an attractive access site for patients with ascites in which fluid around the liver makes transhepatic access, be it percutaneous or transgastric, more difficult and hazardous. Next slide. Um, here's a video. Again, we can kind of show this at the end. Next slide. Now let's talk about a hepaticogastrostomy. This is essentially the same idea with the puncture, dilation, and stent deployment, but with a different target. Now, the specific anatomic features of patients that might make a hepaticogastrostomy preferable to other EUS techniques are based on the intrahepatic access route and the transmural drainage route. Intrahepatic access is the only choice in patients who have a proximal or hilar biliary obstruction and is usually more convenient in patients with a distal gastrectomy since imaging the CBD under EUS is not always possible in these patients with altered anatomy. One advantage of transmural drainage after intrahepatic bile duct over transpapillary drainage is that the challenging step of anterior grade guide wire passage, which actually is required for both rendezvous and anterior grade stenting is avoided. In addition to guide wire passage, rendezvous also requires an accessible pillow, papilla, which is usually not the case in patients with surgically altered anatomy or a tight duodenal stenosis. Next slide. So there's three major approaches to the EUS guided rendezvous technique. You can do an intrahepatic bile duct approach from the stomach, an extrahepatic bile duct approach from D1, or you can go in from the second part of the duodenum in D2. You're gonna access the bile duct using a 19 or 22 gauge FNA needle, and after you aspirate bile and shoot a little contrast in. So following clangiography, you're gonna then use a long guide wire, pass through the access needle into the bile duct and duodenum through the stricture in the ampulla. Now, guide wire manipulation is the most challenging technical aspect of this procedure, as well as key to the success of this procedure. Recent studies have shown that the extrahepatic bile duct approach from D2 often is able to minimize the challenges associated with guide wire manipulation and can improve the success rate of this. However, this approach isn't always feasible because it's often uh, hard to get a good stable scope position. And then a meta-analysis of 15 controlled studies looking at 600 patients who had failed ERCP and underwent rendezvous showed high success rates with a technical success rate of 91% and clinical success rates of 85%. Overall complication rate was 14% and causes of failure of rendezvous um, were most commonly due to inability to pass the guide wire in most of the cases. Next slide. 
So uh, EUS got an integrated biliary stenting. This has been developed and reported as a useful option of biliary drainage because of the theoretical physiological bioflow in patients with uh, inaccessible ampulla. So next slide. Um, so although ERCP is the pr preferred procedure for providing internal biliary drainage, EOS guided drainage is often uh, increasingly utilized in patients who need decompression when ERCP has either failed or is not technically feasible. Now, the, the reported safety and success rates have been variable across many studies. This is a recent meta-analysis looking at 23 studies with about 1,500 patients. The pooled technical success rate with EUS guided biliary drainage was 92%, which is on par with the currently reported values in lit literature, although there was a high heterogeneity percentage, which is likely due to a number of factors, uh, including variations in technique, variations of drainage, such as plastic versus metal stents and lambs, and a steep learning curve associated with EUS guided biliary drainage. Next slide. So. Uh, I'm going to real quick, uh, you can just, yeah, perfect. I'm going to real quick talk about um, EDGE. This is something that's new. So um, some of the strengths of the EDGE procedure is it can be performed with a single endoscopic team all within one day, although it's often split up between two, two sessions. And the technical success rate is over 95%. Some of the limitations is that it's typically only available at tertiary centers. It's got a 14% uh, risk of adverse events, and there is the risk of of possible weight gain uh, after uh, gastrostomy tract creation. Next slide. Um, this is a recent meta-analysis looking at 24 controlled studies and 1,300 patients with um, looking at the pooled and clinical success rate of EDGE. So when you compare EDGE to lap-assisted ERCP and balloon-assisted ERCP, the clinical success rate is 95% compared to 93% for lap-assisted compared to 71 and for uh, balloon, uh, balloon assisted ERCP. Now, the pooled rates of all the adverse uh, events with EDGE were 21%, while lap assisted ERCP had 18%, and balloon had 8.4. Um, some of the most common adverse events seen with EDGE are stent migration, which occurred in about 13% of the patients, followed by bleeding occurring at 7%. Next slide. I actually have a video. Believe it or not, uh, we did the, uh, they did the first uh, EDGE procedure in the Department of Defense, was done at BAMC last week. So. Uh, next slide. Okay, so that's that's the end of my talk. So we can try to play some of these videos, and while they're loading up, we can can do any questions. Does that sound good with everybody? Is there a video that you would like me to play? Um, if you go back up midway to um, slide twenty, I would play some of those. So. All right. Any uh, any questions from anybody? No. Hey Jerry, that, that was a good talk. I just wanted to kind of emphasize to you, you kind of uh, made the point already, but uh, um, pretty much all the EOS guided access techniques mostly uh, used um, when there's altered anatomy or like it's total distortion. Like in fellowship, I think this is like, you know, major tertiary referral center. And we only use like EOS guided techniques maybe five to 10 times. And, um, Again, we, if the anatomy was normal, we never had to resort to EUS because we were good at ERCP. So EUS guided access should not be used as a, um, um, I guess, as a substitute for good ERCP technique. So, mm -hmm. um, so just wanted to make that, or like foot stomp that point. So, but it can be useful uh, in, in those that, um, again, have altered anatomy or, you know, duty and strict you can act as a And at the same time, too, the, those should only be used in malignant restrictions. Obviously, if like colodocalothiasis, you're going to be putting a 
Odoko Duat Nas me and he'd be using something more of a rendezvous technique or something along those lines. But just wanted to put some that. So, so one scenario that I think uh, I didn't really realize you guys could do transgastric intrahepatic ductal access, but like I'm thinking of like a hyalur cholangio where for whatever reason they can't get a stent up from below, and then people will go to PTC and then you struggle, you know, with that patient draining a liter of bile into a bag every day and you're trying to keep them hydrated and stuff. So you could instead drain that bile directly into the stomach. Is that what I'm understanding? Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's that's very interesting. Like, yes, in, so. I remember we had a visiting professor from Japan who talked about how they would make the patients drink their bile every day so they didn't get dehydrated. Seems like this would be a better option than that. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks everyone. Hope you guys learned something. What's your channel? <laughs> <laughs> Have a good day.